Like what the f do I do now? No, 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 no. I recently purchased Woodworking's most dangerous tool being the radial arm saw. And in my video, I wasn't able to actually test some of the functionality of it because the saw just didn't work. Fortunately, I had a fan who I bought wood from in the past who was willing to sell me one of their saws that doesn't get used because it was too dangerous. So I got a 16 inch saw that just showed up here that's been sitting in a warehouse for years and should be perfect for all the testing that we want to do. Oh, and real quick, big thank you to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video. More on them later. Now let's get to it. So when I got the email from Peter at Horizon Hardwoods, I was stoked because he has the exact same model that my buddy Mike Farrington rebuilt on his YouTube channel. And I love this saw. It has the front adjustment knob to go up and down, which means I don't have to reach behind it. And like I said, it's 16 inches. That's a huge There's a few accoutrement in this, and he said this thing runs. I can only move it around with a forklift though, so let's get it to the back of the shop and actually see if I can plug this sucker in. Peter said that, you know, for their lumber facility and their business, they love this saw. He was like, you know, I, th I think it's been in his family for a while. The saw worked great. The only problem was they happen to have employees that come into the business that don't have a lot of experience that they got really uncomfortable using the saw. I got skate. I dropped my hot pocket. Just hilarious, because that's exactly what the video I've been saying is about. It's like, you know, without a bunch of experience, this big old saw blade is quite intimidating. And I agree. I don't think I'd want some brand new employee who's never been around tools really before coming in and immediately grabbing this monster 16 inch saw blade that's spinning at your face as you pull it towards you in order to rough cut wood. You can easily see the apprehensions there. They're amateurs. We need to get this thing running first and cleaned up a bit. It looks decently clean, but what can't you use some lube these days? Yeesh. Make sure you're protecting your eyes while you unpackage things. Chop shades, they're gonna be your best option. So comfortable, so clear, you won't even know that you have them on, I promise. Joe here slept with his on last night. He completely forgot to take them off, didn't you, Joe? I did. Oh, it's so much bigger than I was anticipating. That's what she said. That's what she said. <laughs> it's literally a gigantic saw. So gigantic. This is the one part I was really excited about. Oh, you mean, why? Why is that? Because of how I want to put this against the wall, moving it up and down, this is going to be the better way to do it. If you remember on the other one, that's on top back here. So having that action in the front is awesome. Let's see if we can move that, because when we want to turn it, I wonder if there's a lock on that. Nope, she's just gross. Look, it's just covered in, in gunk. The carbines are in decent shape, though. There's a bunch of real sketchy-ass cuts, and I think anything you do with a 16-inch blade is going to feel sketchy, so I want to try it for you guys to see how dangerous it actually is. And I'm not going to lie, it's just standing this close to it, this thing, even though like a 10-inch or 12-inch blade is huge and dangerous, just very imposing. It's huge. For those of you wondering, this is your normal table saw blade with a 5 8 inch arbor. You can see here how much freaking bigger this thing is. It's insane. Oh, oh. You don't think it's reverse threaded, do you? Tightening it on here, so then loosening it. Actually be taking it back. It is reverse. No wonder. Let's go, you were tightening that son of a bitch. Try again. Watch your dick. Oh, <laughs> let's go. All right, this works, Sam. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, would you give her a bath? All right, and after a little bit of help from an actual electrician, she's got power and she's ready to go. So I'm gonna put the, uh, the blade that has its own orbit back on here, because we cleaned it up really nice. Uh, I'll link that cleaning kit that we used down in the description if you're someone who would like cleaner blades because it's pretty awesome. And then I'm going to pucker my butthole and we're gonna make some crazy cuts. Let's see this sucker run first. And here we go. Holy <laughs> It's so ridiculous. Unlike the other one. I'm gonna wait for that to spin down. My buddy said that. He said it has its own wind. I wouldn't want to cut shit on that. We're gonna cut shit, don't you worry, son. 16 just seems so excessive. 16's is completely necessary. Still spinning. And that was a couple seconds late after I turned it off. Yeah, I can see why the guy who sold this to me was fearful of like young, unexperienced people in their warehouse running this thing, because that's the most intimidating tool I've ever turned on. 
Even worse than the shaper, which terrifies me. Come on, girl. Almost three minutes and it's still running, still turning down. Okay, so now that I got that old girl running, here's what the game plan is. I found an old manual. This is an instruction manual, as you can see, instruction maintenance and parts. And in this instruction manual, there's some of the techniques that they recommended back in the 60s on how to use it. And we're gonna test those because I'm an idiot. Don't try this at home. Starting off, we've got some stuff that's pretty normal. And let me show you those here. We're looking at your regular old cuts. Now this is from a DeWalt saw, but we're gonna start with the cross cut and then the miter cut. That was like the two big things. Then the squirrely shit starts to happen. You can see they've got bevel ripping cuts, dado cuts, rabbiting cuts, plowing cuts. I think the way plowing spelled is pretty funny. Tenoning, shaping, and uh, they have rip cuts, in rip, out rip, bevel, and a compound miter cut. And then lastly, if you've seen Stumpy Nub's video on the radial, he shows the gut cutter or the ripping cut on the saw with a vertical panel and the blade facing your stomach. I don't know if we can do that on my saw because of the way that the bed is on there, but we may give it a shot. We'll see. But let's start out with the cross cut and just start going down the list here. I got a two by four and a four by four. And if you guys recall on our other saw, it was struggling to get through the two by four. I don't know why. So we're gonna fire this sucker up and we're just gonna give her the good old cross cut. See how it goes. Fairly intimidated by this saw, but can't live your whole life being a little bitch. Here we go. Okay, so cross cut on a two by four. It went super smooth, it was actually quite pleasant. The saw is so much weight, I like barely have to do anything. It does need a lot of TLC though. It needs lubricated and cleaned up. I don't know if we're gonna do a video on that. Maybe if this video, what do you think, Joe? 5,000 likes. Now, 10,000 likes on this video, and I'll do a video of tearing this thing down and uh, prettying it up for you guys and giving her an, a Batman paint job. Oh yeah. That was awesome. I guess the reason you want to use a saw like this is going to be to do bigger stuff. So I got a four by four here. Let's give this one a whirl. It's really not bad, it's crazy. Like I am six foot three and this thing is so big. I like, it's like in my chest. Okay, that actually went really well. Cutting bigger stuff is like the benefit of the bigger blade, right? And that's kind of what you're looking for. These saws that are with this size, I do believe it has like a five inch, maybe even a six inch capacity, because it all comes down to what's going underneath the motor, not the actual size of the blade. It's crazy, you have a 16 inch blade, you can only get six inches of cut, but really clean cuts. And that's a, I don't know how old that blade is. We just cleaned it up. Really smooth too, like almost zero resistance coming through the wood, which was awesome. The cross cut went pretty much as expected. The number two cut on our little girl here is gonna be the miter. Let's set it up. The way this saw miters is this whole piece here moves. You've got your positive stop on the top. This lever here has your cam lock for mitering. And then it's got a gauge on here. I'm gonna move this over. I mean, this thing will go the whole way to 90. We're gonna miter like 45. There's a positive stop up here for it. Obviously everything that's for the miter is broken. So, so these are the safer cuts, mostly because I can still keep a lot of the blade in the blade guard, but some of the cuts in, the, in that they're suggesting that you could use this thing on and the, uh, and the rest of that are like absolutely ridiculous. Let's cut a miter. I'm gonna do the blade into the fence first. Is she clear? I don't know if I'll ever get used to that. Look, I'd have to bring the fence out more. Gosh, that cuts so far off. I guess it is what it is. All right, watch yourself, Joe. Like, look at that wind. You see the wind coming off of the saw? Isn't that insane? I mean, when I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. Hmm, I'm slightly corn-fused on how the hell I do this. We're gonna cut this miter in the other direction because I'm a little scaredy pants. Not scared, I just don't wanna be overly dumb. Yeah, so that puts the blade behind our material to start. That's a lot better. Here we go. I don't love having it at my left hand. Well, let's test the Z-Miter. This is so awkward. Like, I want 
Super, super smooth. Pretty nice. Miter cut went fairly straightforward. The depth of the cut doesn't really make sense for me. Also, like, your body's in a really awkward position. I don't love that one. Probably never going to use it for that. On to the next. These cuts are getting more and more ridiculous. And you know what else is getting ridiculous? Is the amount of money that we're all spending on subscriptions these days. Which is why I am pumped to be working with Rocket Money on this video. You can spend a ton of money on subscription services you've had forever and not even know it. Which is going to screw up all of your budgeting for tools, materials, and awesome stuff like this video. Now, Rocket Money's got an awesome app that lets you do exactly that. Everything from budgeting to managing those subscriptions, like I said, and all kinds of awesome features in between. I function better when I can set up automations and Rocket Money can do exactly that, especially with their smart savings tool, which I absolutely love. When you're budgeting to buy ridiculous tools all the time, you've gotta be on top of it, which is why I'm using Rocket Money. Join the over 5 million members using Rocket Money to get their money under control right now using rocketmoney.com slash unscrewed. Unlock all those awesome features, save a few bucks, buy some more stuff that you want for you and your family and stop wasting money in places you didn't know you were. Thank you Rocket Money for sponsoring this project. Now let's get back to these crazy cuts. Up next is the ripping cut in the manual. I am gonna do a bevel cut first. The ripping cut gets pretty wild and I'll explain why here in a sec. So we're gonna bring this, this sucker up. Oh, you need lubed up, my girl. It's a bevel cut, you didn't know. Oh, yeah. It's actually one of the most usable parts of the tool like this. That's when we can turn the blade like this. Cause that's 30 degrees. Oh. There's a 32 and a half and 45 degrees stops. Nothing that'll get me more excited than just coming over here and seeing all this blade just like facing me as I pull the tool. <sighs> Go me. All right, I'm gonna fire it up and then clear the fence and come back and do a cut. <laughs> Safety guards hitting it. Wait three minutes. A little longer than a few minutes later. That's gnarly. Okay, look at that. I can hit the back post at this bevel with my saw. Oh, hell no. Isn't that, that's absurd. How do they miss that safety feature? Well, I guess that's max travel, but like, holy shit, dude. Look at how close that gets. There's a bumper in here that's worn off. See that? Can you get in there? Yeah. And I just turned it to face up. And when I do that, it hits and then this clears, but it clears by like, look at that. That's like a 16th of an inch. Holy terrifying. Like if I wasn't paying attention, I just ran that thing back for the first time. That's gonna king, the blade's gonna break. Shoot me right in the eye. Thank goodness I'm protected with my shop shades. And then I'm going to the hospital. My heart rate's 90 beats per minute right now. <laughs> it got me going. I, my standing heart rate is not normally the 90 beats a minute. Holy shit, that scared me. Okay, I just gotta pay attention to it while we do this cut. So I know a lot of these models come with a clamp that's like a safety that I'm probably gonna need to buy. That's too close for comfort. But that blade spinning, I can't put material over there. It's almost like this blade is so big, it like doesn't allow for as much usage. Maybe I'm supposed to put a smaller blade on for stuff like this. But I do know a lot of guys run this for this cut without the blade guard. Smooth. Just gonna do a little miter test here. I don't love what's happening at the moment. I don't like that the blade has to be like almost in the fence and almost touching that po post to get going. You never wanna start your blade in material. It's stuck in there. Cut number two. Gosh, I hate this. This sucks. It runs right through the cut. I mean, the miters look pretty good. The first one, I didn't have the blade deep enough and I'm not gonna go back to do it. I don't think at a 45 that this technique is something I'm gonna be using often, but the cuts themselves are pretty clean. And you can see like the real rudimentary like stuff, that's not bad off the saw. I didn't dial that in at all. I literally just sent it. 
fence posts and stuff with these tools, that's like a big usage of them, right? Stuff like this on posts to get caps. It's a, it's a decent use of the saw, but I just really do think there's a better way to do it. So I don't hate the bevel cut and like a full cut. I do, however, have a cut with the bevel that I do think I will be using. Let me show you that. So we're at zero here. You could take a digital angle finder, right? I could put on the blade, you know, this bed here, I could zero it, get me dialed in. Ironically, that's like super close to 90. I can take the same concept to crank this sucker up flip it around to the most dangerous, right? The gauge is basically at zero, and then I can pull the pin, come back over, and give myself, say, seven and a half degrees, or seven, whatever you want to call it. Seven and H. And it's gonna turn on and just shoot my piece across the shop. I'm gonna clamp this to the fence here. I'll show you guys this cut. This is pretty cool. So when I turn this on, I can more or less cut some huge dovetails on the saw using that. So I do think I will use that. And then I'll show you the next technique. In the book, there's a tenoning technique that requires a dado stack. I don't have a dado stack. So we're not gonna do any of the cuts that require a dado stack. But what we can do is kind of showcase the tenoning technique you might use if you wanted to just simply use the saw like this. Now, one of the big downsides of this is that the blade guard, it really gets in the way and we're gonna have to bring the saw down. So this will be the first kind of cut that we do with no blade guard on. And you'll see just quickly how dangerous this is without the blade guard on. Just saying. This is not a cut for the faint of heart or the rookie. Pucker up. No blade guard, first cut on a tenoning cut. Now half the battle with this is that it takes so long to spin down, that's just gotta sit there and spin. And look at how exposed it is if someone's like not paying attention and walks by. You could easily really, really hurt yourself. All right, so now that, that after five minutes it's finally stopped, I can swing this back to 90. It's gonna take me two minutes because of this crank. And as cameraman Joe pointed out, I can put the blade guard back on. For your sanity. Sanity. Safety, sanity. And there you go, basically almost a perfect tenon. It'd be a lot better if this piece of wood was square. I'm, I will probably use this tool to make these kind of cuts. Now for some of the sketchier cuts. Get sketchy. I wanna do a ripping cut where you turn the head and I, this is a ripping, I believe it's called out because the saw blade's facing out. Now this thing spins like this. That means if I go from this direction and feed it, it's gonna shoot the material off the saw. They also have a ripping in. Now, where the blade is facing me, I can feed into the blade as it cuts. The problem with all of this, if I wanna use the saw like this and I'm feeding this material, you can easily see how I might get hurt. I'm pushing into the blade and then I'm pinning my arm with like very little room for clearance to the blade itself because the whole blade's up when the table saw, it's down. Incredibly sketch, just gonna say. On the outfeed side, I just have to make sure I flip sides and then the blade's out here, but you're still dealing with the same thing. I'm gonna be feeding from over here and this will give you more throw to feed, but I still have this blade, like I still have to work the material around while pushing it into the fence if I wanna get a straight cut. Absolutely ridiculous. So let's try. The intent of this tool was to Give those who wanted it the ability to pretty much do everything kind of like the shopsmith before uh, you know the table saw became as popular and affordable as it did. When these saws started to get popular, so was plywood. I mean, at least that's what I found in my research. To you know get the usage of both of those, you could see how they would like want you to use it for for plywood stuff there. So I don't like this at all. <laughs> I really don't want to do this. <sighs> Just looking at my heart rate. See where we're at. I think we're back up to 90. It was, at, it was at 99 at one point. A little monitor here, 85, okay. I got a push stick, I got a piece of melamine. I'm just gonna send it. Ugh. YouTube, I love you. 
Look at the dust! Look at the dust! Are you Nope, 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 nope. Okay, didn't think about this, but when I was pushing it through, okay, if you're familiar with woodworking and you've heard of the term kickback. As soon as I heard Wade say the words kickback, I was like, that's a move. As I slide this through, my only option is to put my body directly behind this blade. Well, you saw what it was shooting off of it and that shit didn't feel good. Kickback happens when you don't have your material against the fence and it pinches against the blade and then it pulls it and shoots it back. So as I was pushing it, I realized once I got to this point, I can't push into the fence beyond where I'm at, which means that end of the material could drift. And if that drifts, it could shoot the whole thing off the table back at me, which wouldn't feel good. And so the only way to do it would be to stand here and try and get parallel pressing while I then lose sight of my left hand. See where my hands are here? Well, once my hand gets into this position, I lose sight of it on that side of the blade and I'm just not comfortable with that. So f that cut. Let's try the other one. <laughs> so stupid. You have to switch your feed side because the blade switched. So now I gotta push it from that side. But if you forget, you could get yourself in a tricky situation. <sighs> I should be able to get up to here and here while still seeing my hands though. When it was the other way, it was quite terrifying. Let's see if I can get a full cut though on this. Another great part here is I gotta feed from this side and my power switches all the way over here. There's so much, I wish you could see that. Hit the stop for me. Like, what the f do I do now? If I didn't have a person here, what do I do? Because if I let this go, it's gonna flip up and go on the other side. It'll hit the blade. It's like I'm just supposed to stand here. Grab that for me, Joe. Besides shooting stuff at you, I think it's those little things like, where does my material go once I'm done, right? I can't just kind of push it past. And something I noticed on this cut at the end, because my face was in it, I should have had like a GoPro on, but we can't afford those around here. Was well, this is the piece I cut. It started here, and as it got to the end, the cut towards the end, I could feel it. Now watch the blade. See how much deflection was on the blade in order to get it back? See how much that head was moving? It was pinching the material that much. Pinching is never good in woodworking or cutting things. You don't want it. And not to mention, it was pelting me in the face the whole time with materials. Ah, let's look at some of these other cuts. F those. This is the final cut. This is probably the dumbest and most dangerous cut. 90 degree blade on the outside of the table. As you take your material that's too long for your fence, you run it on the floor and you run it through like this. You build a jig to hold it up vertical. Fortunately for you guys, I'm not that stupid and my saw actually can't do this cut. Whoever owned the saw previously rewired it here and so this is as far as I can get this saw to come out. But you'd extend this blade as far out as it'll go and then run that board vertical on the floor and like either resting on this or something insane. This diagram blew my mind when I first saw it and I couldn't believe that no one was like, hey, this is safe, ridiculous. So since my saw can't accommodate this and I'm not dumb enough to try, that's gonna be a wrap on this one. Let me know what tools you wanna see in future videos. Leave a comment down below and I'll see you on the next one.